Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the highly anticipated return of the GOAT District brought to you exclusively by the Player Profiler Network. Today is Wednesday, June 7th, and boy, do we have a monster dynasty show for you. Renowned expert of the Dynasty War Zone, Randy Young, is back in the district to share some of his hottest dynasty buys and sell. So buckle up for some high stakes, high octane, high win rate, fantasy football goatness, and let's get it. District, you know the Pope listens. Dynasty, our religion, fought the blokes missing on all of these trades, on all of these plays, on all of these grades. By the end of the day, y'all getting played. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex. Send the homie a text. That trash off is the best. You try to make it complex. Then they text you back. Now, all of a sudden, they don't make any sense. <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy. Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy. These trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T District, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's the... And I always be traded. And I always be traded. Traded. And I always be trading. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Bait them. Bait them. Fish. What is up, Fantasyland? We're back in the district for another big one. But first, guys, sometimes life is just really simple, right? You get a toothache, you call your dentist, you get a, a fender bender, you call the body shop. But when you want to talk dynasty fantasy football, guys, you call tonight's guest. Am I right, Dan? Am I right, Theo? This I is love the talking, man. love talking uh, dynasty with you guys and Randy like throughout the year. Like if we have something to bounce off of one another, it's it, we're we're in multiple leagues together, and uh, we're all good friends, and it's like you know it's awesome to to chop it up, and and we've had Memphis on the Goat District so many times, and we've all been on the War Zone multiple times. It's like it's time, fellas. It's it's June, we're back at it. This is like the serious months. The season's around the corner. Uh, we had to drop a Dynasty buys and sells episode. Then. Before we, before we walk in tonight's very special guest, one of, one of the OG GOATs, some people might not know, just a quick reminder, guys, make sure you check us out on your favorite podcast platform. We're out there on all the platforms worldwide. And of course, on Wednesday night, we're exclusively on the Player Profiler Network, 9 p.m. Eastern. You'll find us here every Wednesday night. Make sure you tune into YouTube. Last week, we had Mark Garcia. He joined Dan and I. We discussed actual impacts of touchdowns, coaching changes, ADP changes, and a ton more. Make sure you follow all of us at Goat District, at JD Goat District, at Overhyped Sleeper, no E on the end. And of course, the man beside me, the OG Fantasy. Guys, we have a monster show tonight, and we got a monster guest. Danny, why don't you walk him in, man? Well, what can I tell you about uh, about Memphis? I mean, Randy is the original, <laughs> well, one of the original uh, Goat District uh, podcasters. So he's the, he's the man whose uh, seat I took, actually. So I, I, I feel a special kinship to Randy just for that, because we both uh, have endured JD for many, many years. <laughs> nice. And uh, But anyway, yeah, he's a... He, I mean, there's there's nobody that I would go to before Randy when it comes to trying to figure out something in Dynasty. If I got a, a thorny question, he's the man. Um, when he talks, I listen. You know, I just I, I I plan to do a lot of shutting up tonight and letting Randy go and give us the goodness because he's absolutely fantastic. Um, you want to catch him on the Dynasty War Zone? They've got you know player profiler wisely picked up uh, Randy. And uh, they're they're doing you know how many how many shows have you done now? Uh, oh, like, like show shows? I don't yeah, know. I mean, shows. some for a few. I don't really <laughs> know. 
Um, it's it's been great, um, and it's great to be back. And what Dan's not telling you is actually I lost a loser leave town match. He got me in a figure four leg lock. I could not get to the ropes. I had to tap out. But sometimes you know, like even in pro wrestling. They, they, uh, the, the, the loser leaves town, but the loser still comes back and, and raises some hell. And that's what I'm going to do tonight with uh, my old pals here at the Goat District Podcast. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely a rising star on the Player Profiler Podcast Network. And tell us a little bit about that Kiss the Ring, too. Uh, yeah. A lot of people aren't familiar with that yet. Yeah, so uh, Theo asked me if I would be interested, and of course, when Theo when Theo comes knocking, you come answering. He said, "Hey, would you be interested in, in hosting a, a dynasty?" Or excuse me, I, 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 I gotta apologize. I'm pre-programmed to say the word dynasty first, but it's a fantasy football. It's not necessarily dynasty. It's just fantasy football related. Um, there's going to be an article in the world famous in quotations uh, draft kit coming out from Player Profiler where I laid out my ten commandments of what it means to be a good commissioner, everything from integrity to getting the money to how do you set the draft picks and live versus, you know, all these different things and and how you can do it. We've been very blessed. We have a great presenting sponsor. We're sponsored by Trophy Smack. It'll be every other Monday. Now, it should have been this past Monday. We had some technical difficulties. My guest really tried hard. It just became more than we could overcome from a technical standpoint. So we're going to reschedule this coming Monday. That'll be the 12th, Monday, the 12th. We're going to be back, and then the following Monday, we're going to be back the 19th, and then we're going to go every other Monday on the Kiss the Ring podcast, really to help you guys get ready for for your fantasy football drafts. You know, where to get a trophy, you know, when to do your draft, high stakes, low stakes, just anything you could possibly think of. And on the show, I have a segment. I have two segments. One, it's called Ask Memphis. Hey, I've got a shady commissioner. He did this. He did that. How can how can you intervene and maybe give me an opinion, or you can share your horrible commissioner stories? So this sob did this or did that, and you know what? I'll put them on full blast. I do not redact names, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I have got an amazing guest list lined up, and again, we're going to cover all kinds of stuff. But uh, I want to talk dynasty fantasy football. To be real honest, all right, yeah, there we go, guys. Guys, definitely definitely check out Kiss the Ring Dynasty War Zone, and uh, yeah, we got a lot to talk about tonight. So let's Bobby, get it going, JD. Before, before we do, Theo, real quick, because because you know the boss is watching. So we got we got to get to the boss, and then we'll get deep into the dino. You know, people always ask me, "Hey, what is the the World Series of Fantasy or the Super Bowl of Fantasy Football?" And it's easy. It's the FFPC, the Fantasy Football Players Championship. It's a six million dollar prize pool, and they've had their never too early best ball leagues cranking. Since February. So the FFPC is the answer to so many questions. Hey, hey, where's the best place to get a dynasty orphan? Well, you can adopt a dynasty orphan at the FFPC. That's why we partner with them. If you want to play fantasy football for low, medium, high stakes, seasonal, best ball, dynasty, go to the FFPC. And don't forget, promo code UNDERWORLD to get you $25 off your first team. $25 off your first team, no matter what team it is, no matter what format it is, at the FFPC. Go do it. All right, and we are back. So let's let's just start from the beginning, Randy. Let's let's just talk a little bit about the, the dynasty landscape. When you're coming into a new season, I want to know, what do you do? I mean, I know I know some things you do for sure, but how much time do you spend going through the NFL team by team? What kinds of edges are you looking for when you do that? To tell me a little bit about your process there. Well, for for me, it, it's it's really simple. I, I use our friends at RotoWire. I've um, got a good friend, uh, Theo. Uh, he's the moderator of the Sonic Truth. His name's Adam Seslowski. He turned me on to RotoWire. They have depth charts. And I use those depth charts. And I immediately go to, because er- they're, they're as accurate about as anything you're going to get. They're not perfect. But I'm looking for little pockets of value. I'll give you an example. Keontae Ingram, who plays for the Cardinals. He's listed as the backup behind year seven veteran James Conner. No one's really talking about him. He's a value. I'm looking at Demetric Felton. He's the pass catching back in Cleveland. No one's talking about him. If you use these things, you can find little pockets of, of value. So I, I tend to go through depth charts on RotoWire. I tend to do it right after the NFL draft. We're in the middle of mini camp right now. 
as we're doing this podcast. So we'll have some good information. So I'll peruse all 32 depth charts here again this weekend. And then I'll do it after every game of the NFL preseason, just looking for little edges that maybe I can scoop up a guy here or there. Because if and when that player hits, especially a running back, that's a great opportunity to potentially flip that player in season. You can maybe turn a guy that you got. Like I've been getting a lot of Demetric Felton off of the waiver wire. If he has a good RB2 season, you could maybe flip him at your league's trade deadline for a second. Maybe you package him with something. I don't know. He can be the sweetener in a deal that gets you a deal done. But if you're not out there looking for these little, you know, bottom five roster guys that you can potentially flip or use on a contender, you're kind of missing out. And again, Rotowire is is a, is a great reference. Um, that's what I use. So that's how I use it, and that's when I use it, and that's who I use. I love what you said there because I think that Keontae Ingram, Malik Davis, and then you bring up Felton. A lot of people are on Jerome Ford, and I'll say Pierre Strong. There's a few There's a few backs that like I see very sharp people going in on. Randy, are you, just to clarify it, are you also taking shots on Jerome Ford, or you think that that's a, like a false flag and it's more Felton? Well, I mean, for me, it's Felton. It's the pass catching because he's, he had 99 career receptions in college. He had like 20 his rookie year. He only had a handful last year because he got hurt. Ford hasn't had a, a reception in the NFL. Now, in fairness, he's played one year, but he has zero NFL receptions and he has 31 total college receptions. So he's not the pass, not that he can't catch passes. I think he's more of the true handcuff to, because you're either different than, better than, or the same as the guys you're competing with. And Dimitri Felton, he's a former wide receiver. He plays a different style of running back for Cleveland. I think Cleveland really wants to push the ball. They really want to pass the ball a lot this year. I think Nick Chubb's totally fine. I love Jerome Ford as a potential handcuff breather back. But in a PPR, half PPR world, I really prefer Felton because they're going for about the same. And I think it was Graham Barfield who did the work that one pass target equals 2.8 carries. So for me, if I can get somebody super cheap, give me the perceived because this could change because, you know, Cleveland could sign a could sign a re-sign Kareem Hunt or bring in Leonard Fournette. You never know what can happen in the next six weeks. But based on what I know today, I prefer Felton just by a little bit. And I think it's interesting because, like, Dan, we we suffered through the Cam Akers, the J.K. Dobbins. These injuries happen during the summer often. So, like, these guys that that might be overlooked as handcuffs end up having some of the best contingent value in fantasy. You think about, like, Darrell Henderson, where he was going um, in, in redraft leagues versus where he was going before the Cam Akers injury. It's like uh, – it's, it's wild how much value these guys can gain. Like, if anything happens to Tony Pollard this summer, Malik Davis, like, to the moon. Right, exactly. And that's, you know, one thing that Randy pointed out is, you know, kind of the dif- difference between maybe, you know, your your backup, your true handcuff, and the guy who's going to have standalone value. Uh, you know, because for Ford to get the ca- same kind of value, if, uh, you know, if you get three receptions or four receptions for Felton every week, something like that, that's a that's a lot of receptions, um, and that means that Ford's got to get, you know, nine to twelve carries just to to try to stay even with that, which is going to be pretty tough to do when the guy in front of you is Nick Chubb. So, you know, uh, handcuff is one thing, but uh, being able to find those guys with a standalone value that you can kind of flip in season, because people will get frustrated with Ford, but they're they might not get as frustrated with uh, Felton if all of a sudden he's coming up with uh, you know five or six points every week plus the occasional touchdown. So. Uh, definitely worth getting. And but Kareem let's... Hunt. And Kareem Hunt leaves behind 44 targets and 35 receptions last year. So maybe you give 10% of that or 15% of that to Chubb, but I'll still take a guy that can be, you know, because we play deep leagues, right? You know, 10, 12 starters. And a guy like Felton, to Dan's point, will have standalone value. Yep, absolutely. And when you when you have that many starters, uh, there, there are going to be times where you're scraping that deep. It's just the nature of the beast. Uh so let's let's talk about a couple of st- team specific situations. You know, kind of how you go about them, uh, Randy, and, and and what you do. Let's look at the Panthers real quick first. Uh, when you look at the Panthers, what are you seeing? I I, I see a young quarterback with a, a coach that I'm pretty familiar with. Now, if 
If you followed me on Twitter today, you you noticed that I promised a nugget, a Frank Reich nugget that you are only going to get on the Goat District podcast. So over his, we'll call it five years, he got fired after week nine last year. In the Frank Reich offense over the last five seasons, the running backs average, and this is crazy, they average 7.2 targets per game and 5.6 catches per game. Miles Sanders and by proxy, you know, because he's there too, you know, Chuba Hubbard, it's to the moon. You know, Sanders has a 50 catch season uh, on his resume. You know, he had a 10 touchdown season last year. And and how do you protect a five foot, you know, the pod father likes to joke five foot six. He gets shorter every time Matt mentions his height. But how do you protect a five foot five quarterback? See, I'm, I'm still in this bit. You have him checked down. This is and, and 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 it is true. He is short, and when you can't see over the offensive lineman, you're not dumping down short to the tight end or the drag route. You're dumping down to the wide receiver, or should be the running back on your right or left because you can see them. You can see them in your peripheral vision. You can see them off to the side. You can't see the guy running the three yard drag route because the linemen are six foot five. You're five foot four, and, and you can't see him. So I love Miles Sanders, Frank Reich's offense, and that's five different quarterbacks, starters, plus all the fill-ins. That translates from Andrew Luck to Brissett to Rivers to Ryan to Wentz across the board. They average just over 100 targets per season to just the running back position. Outside of that, I'm, I'm not really in love with Carolina. You know, when I did the Mind of Mansion podcast last week, we called Matt and I, ended the show with Johnny, meh, go. You know, he's, eh. you know, maybe Terrace Marshall breaks out. I, I always like Tommy Trimble, the, the, the tight end. They brought in Hayden Hurst. To me, you know, I forgot about Adam Thielen. For me, the guy that I really want in this offense for Dynasty is Miles Sanders. The rest of the offense is okay. But I see the, the, in the NFC South just being slow, sluggish, slug it out. Who can be the last man standing to win that division? So, Miles Sanders to the moon? Yeah. But everyone else is just kind of uh, wait and see for me. I'm not really buying because I don't see a lot of hope. Because I, I think that this team's going to be bad, and, and they'll have the cap space next year with the rookie quarterback on the rookie contract. Maybe they can go out and get a free agent, wide receiver, trade for someone. I don't know. But that contract gives them a lot of financial flexibility. So I'm not super all in on the Panthers, but I do love Miles Sanders. It's in Dan and you always talk about paying attention to contracts, paying attention to what NFL teams do. And like if that offense takes a big leap forward in Bryce Young year two, it's going to be with Miles Sanders still at running back. So I think that the the idea of of him in Dynasty is that, you know, it's a veteran on his second team, but he still has some unknown upside because he could go back to his prototype rookie year. That was a guy we were taking the first round. I, I remember – uh, you know, there's some really sharp people on Miles Sanders as a first round redraft pick heading into his second year. Uh, and then he fell, you know, multiple years in the dead zone. Now he's back to a place where if he hits that sort of reception total his first year in Carolina, he's going to gain a lot of dynasty value despite, his, you know, being in the league now and entering his uh, fourth year. And because the, this is a young team that's building, What's the last piece you put on a championship caliber team in three years? It's going to be the running back. So Miles Sanders has a lot of runway in this offense over the next three years to, to not really bring in a bunch of competition because they traded away a lot of draft capital, right? Because they had to get the pick to get Bryce Young. And so now they've got the guy. They won't be in cap hell because the quarterback has a cheap contract. Miles Sanders feels really safe for the next two or three years. And we're going to talk about some other running backs in a bit, but yeah, give me some Miles Sanders, man. Let's do a, a quick OTC, guys. Miles Sanders, Randy, or DeAndre Swift? <sighs> from a functionality standpoint, I'm saying Miles Sanders, but from a name recognition standpoint, it's DeAndre Swift. So, like liquidity, uh, you're looking at liquidity when you say that. Yes, I mean, if I'm a contender, I, I want Miles Sanders. If I if I want flash, and I, I want, I've never been one for having a sexy roster with a bunch of guys that aren't winning me money. I mean, I know the stakes you guys play for, high stakes. I mean, we're, we're, we're not saying anything that these good listeners don't already know. And if I'm playing for high stakes or any stakes, I'm not taking the guy who's not won me squat. I'm taking the guy who last year was the RB, I think it was 10 in full point PPR, and that's with a quarterback that didn't check the ball down. 
Carolina improved the offensive line. I think Miles Sanders in for a big season. So even though he's less sexy than Swift, I think my practicality just wins out. I'll, I'll, throw, an, I'll throw another name at you first, Theo, and then you and Dan can can quickly comment on all three. Rashad White, who's another guy going in that range and who's been who's very polarizing, I find, uh, out there in fantasy land right now, Randy. Rashad White, Randy. You got to say Rashad White. Oh, dude, it, it's, it's, it's Rashad White because of the age. It's the same thing. He's insulated because there's no point now in a running back to a bad team. Why are you going to overpay for a bad running back or draft a running back? Rashad White, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow your minds later with a different stat, but last year, Baker Mayfield was the quarterback with the highest percentage of checkdowns to the running back position of any quarterback in the league. 11.6% of his passes were checkdowns. Rashad White is a check down catching machine. I told the pod father last week that I think Rashad White's going to get 100, ca- 100 targets this year. I, now that I saw that stat on Baker, I feel like that's low. I feel, I feel like, and that team's going to be bad playing from behind. Rashad White is going to be a smash. He's insulated because of the bad team, though they're continue to be, and they're not exactly in the, in the friendliest of cap shape. Because they still are paying Evans and Godwin, and they got to pay Werfs and all and, and De- Devon White and all these guys. So Rashad White, easy Theo, easy. See, you thought I was going to say my man Miles Sanders, uh, even though I love got, Miles Sanders. Gotta say, I got to be gotta, honest. We got to be company people too on that. We're Rashad White website, everyone. Dude, I, <laughs> I, I, do, do you know how many startups I've done this year where I've been able to stack premium wide receivers in a dynasty league, like go three deep at the wide receiver position or quarterback wide receiver wide receiver? Because I know that Rashad White's ADP has been in the seventh round, and I know that I can grab him, quote unquote, two rounds early. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy having Rashad White as my RB one this year. Big love because then you can come around the next round and get Miles Sanders, and I can have both. Mm-hmm. Yep, I'll go I'll go uh, Rashad White over Miles Sanders, and then in terms of DeAndre Swift, I mean you bring up liquidity. I think that I'm going DeAndre Swift. I think that there's a chance he could outscore Miles Sanders this year if it if it bounces right. The quality of the offense, and you in a lot of dynasty leagues, Randy, you can trade. Uh, you can trade DeAndre Swift for Miles Sanders plus. So it like trade equity matters. Dan, where are you at on on those two? Yeah, so I you know in a, in a vacuum, I'm taking Sanders. Um, you know, kind of irrespective of price. Um, Rashad White, I've you know I have my reputation to maintain. I've I've not been a Rashad White guy all along, so I'm going to continue to not be a Rashad White guy. I think he's going to find a way to. Uh, to not succeed in the role because I don't think he's very good at running in between the tackles, but you know, he can, he can be a good satellite back for sure. Um, I'm just, I, I'm not sure that he's going to be a full service back. And, and somebody was asking about, does he have a, a Sean Tucker problem? I don't, you know, I wouldn't call it a Sean Tucker problem yet. Uh, Sean Tucker's an undrafted free agent, so he's got a ways to go. I mean, Sean Tucker is a guy that I I've grabbed boatloads of in rookie mm-hmm. drafts. Absolutely because of the fact that there is some promise there. But to go as far as saying Rashad White has a, a, a Sean Tucker problem, I, I wouldn't say that. They give him a lot of money for, for an undrafted free agent, but he's still right. going to make the team. Like, a lot of things can happen when you're an undrafted free agent. And then they just added Chase Edmonds, didn't they? Yeah. Chase yeah. So, no, so literally, no, Ed- they added nobody. They, 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 they added a z- <laughs> zero with, sh- with shoes. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. I, I, I'm not a fan of Chase Edmonds at all. If, if I like anyone worse than Rashad Wade, it's definitely Chase Edmonds. <laughs> I mean, and this is a team. Why, why would they want to add anybody any good? They're not yeah. trying to win games. Yeah. Yep. They just want bodies at this point. But uh, they're, to, to me, Chase Edmonds is, you know, he's just a guy who's proven he knows how to fail over and over again. Uh, those are the guys you want to cut loose from your dynasty teams. Find somebody else who's willing to take them. I mean, honest, I, I'd take probably Demetric Felton straight up for uh, for Chase Edmonds if I had to. Chase so, Edmonds is not on any of your dynasty rosters, Dan. I'd, I'd bet uh, money on that. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> yep. Um, so let's let's move on. Uh, you know, is it? Is there any value to be found on the NFL teams that are quiet quitting? I mean, we can't say tanking because, of course, nobody ever tanks in the NFL. We know that. So there's yeah. no tanking teams, but there might be a few teams that quiet quit. And one of them might be the Cardinals. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that, Randy? 
I, I absolutely love the Cardinals. So this year, my buy on offense is the Pittsburgh Steelers. Everybody's going into year two, year three, whether that's Pickens, whether that's Pickett, whether that's Friar Muth, Najee. I just love the Steelers this year. A lot of quiet underlying value in a division that should score points. Next year, it's going to be the Arizona Cardinals. Here's the year ahead of getting a year ahead. I love Trey McBride. 98th percent dominator rated in college per player profiler. I mean, that's it's amazing. I know it was at Colorado State, but when you're the man at Colorado State, who are you trying to stop? Trey McBride, and they didn't do it very well. The kid's really good. Oh, and Zach Ertz, he blew out an ACL and an MCL in Week 10 last year. He's probably going to pup list if he plays at all. I'm an old guy. Injuries don't get better as you age, so I, I don't expect a lot of that. I love Michael Wilson. Again, same thing. You're either better than, different than, or the same as your competition. He is different than Rondale Moore. He is different than Marquise Brown. He is different than Greg Dortch. He is a big body. He's 6'1", 6'2". He's a boundary wide receiver. DeAndre Hopkins is gone. Oh, and this team's going to be bad. And what do bad teams do? They throw the ball a lot. So what are you going to get? A lot of cheap. I don't care if it's garbage time. It all pays the same. A lot of cheap garbage time production. And I mentioned earlier in the show, Keontae, like him a lot. And I like him because I, I love James Conner, ton of respect for what he's done. But he's going into, I think it's year seven of his NFL yeah. career, the 2017 mm -hmm. class. He's had some injury issues of his own in the past. And when you're like literally the next guy up, as we all know, I mean, Theo, you play DFS, you play best ball. You, you, you know that like Keontae is literally one – James Conner hamstring away from being the quote unquote free square, probably week nine or something of the NFL season. Keontae Ingram is on a collision course with being like a 50% fab guy this year. <laughs> um, it's, yep. it, it's, I have a lot of Keontae Ingram on dynasty and I'm trying to, to draft him when I can in, in, in early redrafts. And I think that like Dan, that's one thing that Dan is really good at is identifying these guys that nobody wants anymore and buying them and i and randy i think that there's also an argument to buy if you're a contender buy just buying james connor because james connor is going to get the ball till he falls apart and like you might get a first half of the year james connor you might look up and say oh he's running back 10 despite the fact that arizona has like two wins because well, he catches the ball he runs the ball and right now he's he was he was a top 10 uh running back in points per game for back-to-back -back years but i just think it's like these offenses, like Dan brings up, like the quiet quitting. Once the dynasty marketplace starts, like really hating a team and not wanting to to have exposure to these guys, it's like the old the old Warren Buffett saying, like when there's when there's fear, there's opportunity. The the, the last puff of a cigar, you know, he, yeah. he he wants to find that cigar laying in the street that he can get one last puff out of. Dude, that's James Conner. Like if you're heavily exposed, and I know you probably are to Brees Hall or maybe Javante Williams, and you're looking for a guy because you're afraid those guys will either get pupped or come off to a slow start. Dude, James Conner on a contender is an absolute free square. Go give up your 24 second for him right now if you're a legit contender. Like maybe you finished in like the final four last year. You had like the 109 or 110, 111, whatever, and go get James Conner because he's going to, especially if you're counting on like a Brees Hall or a Javante Williams, because he's going to bridge you. And, and you know what? I'll burn seconds into the ground if it gives me a chance at winning real money. That's that's how I roll. I'm going to throw one more quick name, Arizona. I was going to keep it for later, but since we're on the topic, I don't know if we'll get there. Greg Dortch uh, gave you a couple top 10 receiver uh, weeks last last year. And with Hopkins leaving, as much as you know, we're, we're not investing maybe for this year other than at running back, like we said earlier, this team's going to be throwing the ball no matter who it is because they're, they're not going to be great, let's face it. Uh, so I, I think Dorch might have a chance, man. It's not like they're going to go spend, you know what I mean? Or, or, or they don't need to replace anything. Like we said, they're not competing. So I think a guy like that who's proved himself last year uh, when the time aroused, he, 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 he might have a good opportunity this year in this offense. to, to You know, he's, he's a boring depth receiver piece, which is never fun, but I just had to mention it. What's great is, J.D., is that you're exactly right with Dorch. He's the cheapest of the three between Hollywood, Roundell Moore, and Greg Dorch. And you know what about Greg Dorch? He doesn't seem to get injured as much as Hollywood or Moore. So if you're going to get the cheapest guy with the most upside, who's the healthiest of the three, I think that's a that's a two-way win. So I agree 100% on Dorch. I just worry about with Dorch, it's like the, the Cliff Kingsbury system. The only wide receiver that they go out and drafted was Michael Wilson, 
who's like an anti Cliff Kingsbury wide receiver. Um, so like Dorch and to some extent Rondell Moore kind of benefited from them being in, in four wide, uh, you know, often and three wide all the time. So I don't know. I just worry about a guy like Dorch because I, I understand the arguments for him, but you know, he sort of caught fire. We have a small sample size. Yeah, but Theo, um, Theo, you, Theo, you can send your sock right now and you'll probably get Dorch or you take him in the last round of your best balls like I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. well, well, here's the thing, though, but, but Kyler himself's coming off of an ACL. So is he going to run as much as he used to or is he going to chuck it deep more than he, than he used to? I think the pass attempts in Arizona are going to go up. So that's just another lottery ticket because Greg Dorch is fast. Here's another lottery ticket because Greg Dorch is fast. Here's another lottery ticket because Marquise Hollywood Brown is hurt. So, so all of these things, it's little. These are the little micro edges. But especially if you're playing like Dynasty Best Ball, Greg Dorch is – give me the cheapest with equal upside to the other guys. That's just – it's going to allow you to – it's like it's like a budget because if you get Greg Dorch way later on down the line, it's going to allow you to spend up where someone else is taking Hollywood Brown or Rondell Moore. So I love the Greg Dorch call. Yeah, so let's let's transition from that. And, uh, you know, sometimes we see teams with a lot of new wide receivers. Like, I can think of a couple of them uh, right off the top of my head. We have Green Bay and we have uh, Kansas City. You know, it's just wide receivers galore. They're just, they're just grabbing them up by the dozen and trying to see who sticks. Randy, what do you do in those situations? How do you sort that kind of stuff out right now before training camp has even started? So with, like, the, the, the wide receivers and, like, trying to figure out these uh, ambiguous – you know, quarterback positions, what target share is going to be. Same thing, man. G give me the cheapest guy at the cheapest acquisition price. You know, I, I like Christian Watson. Uh, we had uh, Alan Soslowski on the, the Dynasty War Zone a couple of Sundays ago. We did a show called Surge, Sophomore Surge or Sophomore Purge. And one of his surges was Christian Watson. And I really like Christian Watson. I don't know how much I love Jordan Love. Because this entire Green Bay offense, it feels like Walmart brand San Francisco. Everything's the same. The offense is kind of the Shanahan offense. You know, maybe Jordan Love can be as good as horrible to say Brock Purdy. You got like a, a budget level George Kittle. You got a budget level Debo. You know, everything feels slightly less than. But let's be honest, this is a division that's very winnable. You know, so for me, I, I just, again, in Green Bay, I would love to say I want the cheapest guy, but the guy I want in Green Bay is Jaden Reed. I, I love Jaden Reed. I don't know how he's going in third rounds of super flex, tight end premium leagues, but he has been. He did in a couple of the leagues that we've all done together. It's baffling because the slot wide receiver, who's the security bl blanket in the, in the Shanahan offense? It's Cooper Cup in LA. You know, it's Debo Samuel in, in San Francisco. Why wouldn't it be Jaden Reed? In Green Bay because the offenses are all similar. They're all derivatives of each other. So for me, I'm, I'm always looking for, for the cheapest guy or the guy flying the, the furthest under the radar. I love that. I mean, like Christian Watson, I have high hopes for, but I think that there is a better percentage chance than a lot of Christian Watson managers would, would like to, to you know acknowledge that a year from now, Jaden Reed could be the most valuable uh, wide receiver for Green Bay and Dynasty. Like he could be just a natural. This could be the guy that that steps in and, and is a very very efficient slot wide receiver. Um, and I think that he's just so cheap right now. I had a ton of Jaden Reed. Um, Dan, your your thoughts on that? That that is a spicy take there, Theo. I will, I will definitely give you that. It's um, it, we'll put it twenty five percent. I think he's legit. Yeah. Like Christian Watson to me is uh, good. Yeah, twenty five percent for a guy that you can get this late. Uh, I, I, I love Reed. I, I picked him up everywhere I could. He was another one of my guys I was just absolutely hammering as much as possible in my dynasty drafts. And, but, and don't be surprised if and we look back a year from now and we're like, holy crap, Christian Christian Watson was the Brandon Ayuk in this offense. You know, he was mm -hmm. fine. You know, Brandon Ayuk last year, when you use all 17 games as your sample, he was the wide receiver 15. But that's clearly not who you're drafting right now at ADP. And, and yeah. would he? And, and the question I ask myself is: Would Brandon Ayuk have been wide receiver fifteen if Debo had performed at a little bit closer to the level that he did in twenty twenty one? So you got to kind of look at roles and how these will fit within the offense. I know we're not talking running backs right now, but the running back I want in Green Bay, 
not an overhyped sleeper drop that last E. It's a, a, a post hype sleeper, and that's AJ Dillon. You know, he was a guy last year who burned a lot of GMs because he was supposed to have gotten his breakout year last year. Here's the secret: he still did okay, and he got a 50% snap share last year. How do you protect a young quarterback? You pound the ball a little bit more. So for me, um, in that offense, I, I do love Jordan Love. I, I've been stashing him like a uh, like a, you know, Jerry and I said like when you were a little kid, your grandma would give you like a fifty dollars savings bond, and now it's worth like fifty one dollars and fifty cents. Mister, I'm ready to get my dollar fifty out of uh, Jordan Love because time to cash that one in. There you go. <laughs> and I think you talk about contingent value with like the lower end handcuffs, like AJ Dillon a year ago was a guy that people were trading first rounders for and had such high hopes for. Now the value has gone down. Uh, and Aaron Jones is getting older and he played 17 games last year and he played 15 games the year before. These backs, when they start to get older and they can, and they're eventually going to miss some time. And AJ Dillon, Dillon has a ton of contingent upside in that offense. What if uh, AJ, uh, you mentioned Aaron Jones? This contract is that he can get cut at the end of this year without much of a cap penalty. What if Aaron Jones, like if they're not competing or they're not competing for a wild card or a, or a division title, what if he starts making business decisions? And you know, he's like, "Hey, next season, you know, I, there's this big uh, running back class we we got to talk about, and I'm going to be right dead in the middle of it if I get cut next year." I got to take care of myself. I got to be healthy and uh, I'm not playing through this hamstring. So I think AJ Dillon offers a ton of upside where he's going in dynasty drafts and going to be a, a steal in redrafts. I, I think both, I think both running backs, man, I think this offense last year was top 15. When you're looking at a rushing play percentage, you got to think they're going to run the bar, the ball more now with Rogers gone and, and love back there. So I think both of these guys, I think where they're going are good value. Aaron Jones goes kind of past uh, he's at the end of a tier for me when I'm drafting redraft and best ball. Um, and, I, and I love the A.J. Dillon take, Randy, because, yeah, last year we were big on him and he burned a lot of people. And those are the best guys to get. We're going to talk about another guy like that later on. Yep, absolutely. So let's let's just kind of talk a little bit about uh, Randy kind of alluded to it. But uh, let me ask you first in general, Randy, how much do you look at the salary caps and contracts on a team or player level? And what are you looking for when you do that? I am always looking for guys in contract years, especially running backs. You have got to you have got to ball out as a running back. You've got to you know set yourself up. You know Barkley. You know I don't get why he's complaining. He got a fourth overall pick contract. He's made about fifty million. I don't. You know I don't. I, I get why Austin Eckler's a little sideways about his money. I I don't get why 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 he is. So I look at these contracts to figure out. Hey. You know, if I'm counting on Justin Herbert, by the way, I mentioned that Baker stat earlier, Justin Herbert, number two on the checks down to the running back position. And if Austin Eckler is not there with Justin Herbert in that offense, what happens to his value? You know, who's a guy in a bad situation that I don't like that could potentially land in a good situation that I can get cheap now? And could love next year. Maybe that's Cam Akers who's going to be a free agent next year. So I'm always looking at the, Joe Mixon. Everybody kept telling me all off season, I'm Memphis, you're crazy for going out there scooping all that Joe Mixon. You know what? The Brown family's getting their money, and they paid they paid Joe Mixon a handsome bag. And you know what? They're not cutting him, even if he gets in quote unquote legal trouble. The NFL's not suspending him till next year. If Cincinnati thought Joe Mixon was a problem. Guess what? Joe Mixon would have a backfield mate like Zeke Elliott, like Leonard Fournette, like Kareem Hunt, because Cincinnati wants to win a Super Bowl. That's their bell cow. So that's kind of how I look at like contract situations and stuff to kind of help me figure how does their future, which is, you know, it sounds odd. We're not even we're still three months away from the start of the 23 season, but I'm kind of already looking at like what's 24 and what kind of angle should I be shooting based on what kind of roster I have currently? Right, exactly. Yep. And I think that that makes a ton of sense. And, you know, to, to your point on Barkley, it's like I, I also don't understand why he's he's upset about this thing and he wants to get a contract. I mean, basically what he wants to do is become the next Dalvin Cook and get some low money to start with. And then just when he is about ready to get paid, then he's going to end up getting cut. So, uh, you know, it's it's nice to get that good signing bonus. I get that. But 
you know, once you're past that, uh, the Dalvin Cook style contract just doesn't work anymore. So, you know, getting that franchise tag isn't the worst thing in the world, I don't think. Real quick, guys, any thoughts on Chase Brown, just because Frank's asking, and I know he's a, a, a rookie favorite deep, you know, when you're looking deep. I mean, for me, Chase Brown got steamed up so hard in these rookie drafts that I didn't end up with any. Like, Chase Brown was going ahead of Jaden Reed. You're talking about a, a, a round five running back going ahead of a round two wide receiver. You saw that a lot. And I saw some sharp money on Chase Brown, and I, I kind of get it. There's a chance that he could be a handcuff running back, but I don't think that that – I don't think that I think that that's a hope more, more than anything. more people worried that that Mixon doesn't. Pan I think out people, really? people worried about that, but I think that ship has kind of sailed. I think now the Chase Brown value is hey, it's an older running back, and we think that he's Samaj P. Ryan plus, where he could step right in for Mixon if Mixon makes his time okay. in one of the best offenses in the league. But I don't know if he's won that. I don't know and, if he'll be the handcuff. And if, if anything happens to Mixon, I'm telling you, they're going to bring in a veteran off the street. They're not putting their Super Bowl hopes on the back of a rookie that, I mean, I didn't see it the way that the Podfather saw it, but like he literally destroyed Brown coming out of the coming out of the senior bowl. Like he was like not athletic, didn't look great. Like I said, if, if something happens to Mixon, I firmly expect them to bring in like a Lombardi Lenny or a guy like that. So even if Chase Brown were to get the injury good favor in his fortune, I think that they're not going to turn their Super Bowl hopes over to a rookie. Now, if that was Arizona, it's a different question. If it was Tampa Bay, it's a different if it's if you were asking the 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 Chase Brown question about Sean Tucker because he's in Tampa Bay behind a team that doesn't care about bringing in veterans, then yes, that that's a great way of looking at it. But because of the Bengals situation, it's a it's 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 apples to oranges. They're both fruit, but they're a little bit different. Right. Yep. And and that's the thing with Brown. There was just so much helium on him during the the main rookie draft season that he got steamed way up there. And I did. You know, I was a tra- Chase Brown truther all the way through the draft process. And then he ends up in Cincinnati, and I'm like, oh, this is one of those situations that looks. Really, really good, but it's actually almost worse for him because of the fact that this is a team that's not going to, you know, throw everything on the plate of a rookie, especially not one drafted as low as Brown. Now, if he was drafted in the third round or something like that, I might have a little bit more hope for him. But, you know, we know that they're going to go a different way. He's not going to end up with that whole workload almost assuredly, but people are buying him as if he was. So if you can find somebody like that to sell your Chase Brown to, uh, I would definitely sell and JD, you could have you could have gotten Eric Gray two rounds behind Chase Brown, and Eric Gray I think has just as good of, of a chance of being in the handcuff. And it's it's the same sort of argument. It's an older running back um, who also gets targeted. You could have gotten Evan Hole, who still has to compete for the for the backup job. But I know you're an Evan Hole guy, JD. You could get Evan Hole like three rounds later in some rookie drafts. So I don't know. Yeah. It's just sort of a like. They all have similar ranges of outcomes, and one was super, super expensive. Just fade them. And if Chase Brown burns me, then, you know, I'm still not going to come back and start drafting fifth-round running backs in the <laughs> mid-second. Yeah, and, and this year's uh, kind of depth at receiver with regards to draft capital kind of it, it highlights the mistake of taking those running backs a bit too early in, in those rookie drafts. So all, all valid, guys. Great discussion. Let's get into part two here. We're, we're, we want to talk more buys and sells. I mean, it's dynasty, guys. We're talking about it anyways. But let's get into the second part here. Buffalo Jacksonville, Randy, is another interesting backfield, polarizing. How do you see these two backfields playing out? Can James Cook and Travis Etienne give Fantasyland what they wanted last year? Or do you think these guys are just victim or victims of their offenses? Uh, well, I have got the scariest stat on Travis Etienne that, that I could possibly bring to the GOAT district, and I forgot to link the guy's name. Guys, DM me on Twitter. I'll retweet it again. I retweeted it on the 6th. Oh, my God. I think his so, name was Pedro Rahomas. Yes. And, 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 oh, and I, dude, I've got that. I'm going to share it right now. I've yeah, got it ready. Please, thank you very much. So, so, so Jalen Hurts was the quarterback that checked down the least last year. At 3.4% of his 460 pass attempts. You know who he was tied with? If you guess Trevor Lawrence, you guess correctly. Trevor Lawrence has a lower check down rate to the to the running back position, the same as Jalen Hurts and worse than Lamar Jackson. So we always talk about Lamar Jackson. Oh, he's so bad for the running back. He never checks down. Guess what? 
neither does Trevor Lawrence. And this was the uh, the the hat that everybody was hanging their Travis Etienne value on. Sorry about your luck. He had 35 catches last year. That's probably what you're going to get this year. You know, I really want to like James Cook. I actually traded for him in a league that we're in. Yeah, thank you, JD. If you're watching on YouTube, and, and you should be, Pedro H. Rahormes, R-H-O-R-M-E-S. My Spanish is not what it used to be. So his, um, his handle is, yeah, R-H-O-R-M-E-S underscore. Yeah, and it, and it was a great tweet, and I, I definitely want to give him props, but that blew me away. I was shocked. I was amazed. I was shamazed. Nice. Trevor Lawrence, but by the way, here's the one. Remember, everybody, Clyde Edwards-Alaire was going to be the next Brian Westbrook. It's hard to be Brian Westbrook when Patrick Mahomes only checks down 4.1% of the time, which is even worse than Lamar Jackson, too. He's actually the third least friendly for QB. So for me, at cost, and I know those are like the famous last words, but at cost, I will gladly take James Cook over Travis Etienne. You know, they, they moved on from um, – Devin Singletary, he's now in Houston. Yes, they brought in a guy that I like in Damian Harris, but speaking of guys that can't stay healthy. So given the situation, given that stat, man, that stat blew me away. First time sharing it on a podcast, not even my own, but the Goat District podcast, only on the Player Profiler YouTube network. Blew me away. When, when I say that to you, Theo, because I know you're Team ETN. I'm Team Najee. I wanted to I wanted to flex uh, two ETN trades that I've <laughs> that I've I've Let's made recently. I traded I traded ETN and Christian Kirk to get Saquon Barkley for a team that I think is going to ship it this Ooh, year. Oh, I like that. That's and I like that I a lot. Also did a ETN. Mm -hmm. um, I traded ETN and Tank Bigsby for Jackson Smith and Jigba and Michael Mayer in an FFPC tight end premium. So like I crushed that one. The uh, Long Island police are outside your front door right <laughs> now. The police banging on my door for that one. But they're, yeah, that's they're but I feel like it's a like ETN. I'm getting incredibly nervous. Um, I think that there's the fact that they didn't target him last year, and then they added Bigsby and Calvin Ridley's coming in there. You're showing that stat. I think and Dearness Johnston I, and Dearness John. I mean, I, I get he's not, but he's not a huge thing. But any target he takes yeah. is one less. It's you're right. It's it, it's just a bringing in a running back who has had success in the NFL, adding him in there, and it's it's completely by design. You know the the not not targeting ETN that that's coming from the top. That's a that's a Jacksonville stylistically. They targeted their wide receivers and their tight ends a great deal, and now they are better at wide receiver this year. So it is it is scary times. I I think that that you know to me that's the difference between. You know, what's the design of the offense and how does a quarterback run an offense? So, like, within the Jacksonville offense, you know, within Doug Peterson's offense, within Andy Reid's offense with Kansas City, yes, there is the, you know, running backs catching passes is a part of that offensive design. But how the quarterback is running that offense is a completply different thing. Because quarterbacks, when they, anytime they're running an offense, they're going to take the things they feel most comfortable with, the things they like to do, and they're going to do more of that, and they're going to do less of the things that they are, they don't feel as comfortable with, or they just don't like it, or whatever. Um, you know, so this to me is kind of the difference because you know we now have some evidence that Trevor Lawrence wants to play kind of the same way that Patrick Mahomes plays and just not check it down that much. He wants to run around a little bit more and keep looking downfield and try to make that big play. And 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 Dan, you said it very well. Patrick Mahomes, Trevor Lawrence, really quick processors, have good wide receivers. They're not afraid to go to option two, three, four. Whereas Jalen Hurts and Lamar, it's maybe it's option one and two, and then I'll run. So mm -hmm. it's it's the same result in lacking of checkdowns to the running back position for different reasons, but the same reason to have hesitancy. And I think Travis Etienne's ADP is a little too high for me. He's a sell. If I could, you know, if if I could get out, I, I love Najee. I'm an unapologetic Najee. It's like it's the it's the Peter. We, we always do this every time I'm on this show. We do the Peter Griffin boat thing. It's like Najee Harris has already been a, a running back three. He's basically unopposed. I know we like Jane, Jalen Warren, but that's a different conversation. You know, he's been the wide receiver. I mean, the running back three on a season had 300 fantasy points. And it's like, well, Travis Etienne could be anything, including a running back three who could get you 300 fantasy points. But we got the guy versus the guy that could be the guy. It's it's it, it's baffling. Give me Najee and whatever plus I can get on top. And I'll give yeah, Randy, I'll give Randy a, a quick shout out because I took a lot of heat in the GOAT district last year 
from Dan and JD for my James Cook shares that I drafted. And Randy Absolutely. was Randy was big on James Cook in the Dynasty War Zone last year, um, based on what you know we thought Buffalo wanted to do with him, where they try to bring in a pass catching running back, and it didn't happen in year one. But like that's a trade you can make right now. You can make Travis Etienne for James Cook and a whole lot. Like you can get a lot on top of James Cook for Etienne, and I think that there is a a universe where. James Cook is going to be like running back 18 and Travis Etienne might be like running back 19 or 20. There's an, uh, there's a chance that this can happen. So um, I think James Cook's super interesting. All he's got to do is absorb the, the Devin Singletary targets and forget Damian Harris. Like even da- if Damian Harris is a thing, like Memphis, you brought up the fact that he can't stay on the field. He's also never targeted. Like he's, he's a guy that, that, that NFL, that NFL offensive coordinators, have used between the tackles and are not, you know, getting the ball out in space as a receiver. So like Buffalo wants to do that clearly based on where they drafted James Cook, how they flirted with JD McKissick. They try to get Christian McCaffrey. Like they've wanted this sort of a, a running back. And I think James Cook is a great, great value right now. And redraft, you can get James Cook in like the ninth round right now, uh, and the eighth round. And in Dynasty, he's he's cheap. So I, I would uh, kick the tires on him. I like that one a lot. Yeah, the, the value on James Cook at his cost versus Etienne is is a no-brainer. And that round where Cook is going, I mean, there's some sweet, sweet value at running back in dynasty drafts. I've got on the screen at MFL Football, um, rival NFL executive on, on Buffalo Bills' second-year running back. Buffalo and many throughout the league expect James Cook to have a massive breakout season. He'll be their RB1, rush for 1K yards, yada, yada, yada. But just to kind of back what we're saying, the other thing I want to add is – Guys, let's face it. Buffalo is only going to have so many cracks at this. They haven't had, they haven't, they haven't pierced through right yet to where they want to get. They're going to change things up this year. They bring in Kincaid. They're going to use James Cook more. You're going to see things change a little bit out there in Buffalo. I think, uh, in, especially at the offense. Hey JD, one last stat for you. So week thirteen, and I, I just you know, and this is full PPR. But in week 13, when James Cook came on, so weeks 13 through 18, yes, I'm, I'm counting the last week because they were still playing real football, including the game that, that James Cook lost. James Cook ala- averaged 11.16 PPR points, and Travis Etienne averaged 11.0. So over the last, what is that, six games of the season, they were actually basically dead even. But to Theo's point, if you could get one, and a whole lot of extra plus, and I still get my same 11 points per game, and I got the plus, I win. Guys, I got to give a shout out to the chat. We haven't given a shout out to you guys. You guys have been killing it tonight with the chat. I, I'm trying to get as many comments as I can on the screen. You guys are killing with the questions. We, I, I know you've got trade questions, and we're, we'll usually uh, get to as many as we can. I know Dan's in there answering some in the chat, so Dan, good job there. Uh, but we want to get to some more questions with Randy tonight. Make sure you smash the like, guys. Smash the subscribe. We, we, we're on this channel every every Wednesday, 9 o'clock. Show the support if you like what you're hearing tonight. We're trying to give you guys some alpha, dynasty, high stakes uh, content tonight and every Wednesday. Let's go to the tight end position. Randy, as we talk about the FFPC, tight end premium. Most leagues these days, super flex tight end premium. After Kelsey and Andrews, it gets pretty flat at tight end. I know we all have our, our, our you know, our, our favorites uh, as you go down in the tiers, but who are guys that you like in the lower tiers uh, that can, you know, maybe give you a little boost this year in these tight end premium leagues? Well, I'll be a, I'll be a, a shameless shill and I'll plug real quick. This is why you subscribe to Player Profiler's YouTube channel because you would have heard me last week on the Mind of Mansion, my hot take. You know, the Podfather says, "Take us out on a hot take." I said, "Mike Gusecki is this year's." Evan Ingram, a guy who goes to a new team who can be a top five tight end because the, the, the situation dictates it. I love it when your former boss brings you in and, and gives you an opportunity. I think so. Go look. And I know it was a one season sample, very small, and it was Tom Brady. But go look at the 2011 Patriots and look at the tight end usage between Gronk and Aaron Hernandez. I use the term Walmart great value earlier. If if Henry and Gusecki can be poor man's Walmart version of Gronk and Aaron Hernandez, we all win. Um, the guy that I'm fading in the top 10 is Kyle Pitts. I, I would love to, to be able to get out of Kyle Pitts. No offense to Kyle Pitts, he's really good at football. 
But here's the thing. Oh, why do you like Kyle Pitts? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked, faithful listeners. Well, I'm going to share with you. If you go to playerprofiler.com and put in Kyle Pitts, you'll see a tremendous athlete. If you go to also while you're at playerprofiler.com and put in Mike Kosecki, you're going to see an even better athlete. It doesn't matter how good of an athlete you are. It doesn't matter how good you're in college. All that shit stops mattering the minute you get to the NFL and how is your team going to win. The podfather and I cracked this code last Wednesday on the Mind of Mansion. The NFC South is going to be, the word he used is mudder. Mud, 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 slow, slow, mud, mud. Because all the teams have better defenses than offenses. Eh, Atlanta to be, but how does Atlanta want to win? Probably on the back of uh, Theo's boy. Maybe you've heard of him, B. John Robinson. How does Carolina want to win? Pretty good defense. What did the Saints still have? Pretty good defense. What does Tampa Bay potentially still want to do? Pretty good defense. It's going to be a slow, ugly division. People love Kyle Pitts. I'll gladly, you know, fight out there in the bargain bin with guys and and, and just move on. Goes JD. You're right. There are three guys. There's Kittle. There's Kelsey. And there's Andrews. Love Sometime. that you added Kittle. Love well, that here's the here's the thing. I, I said this on, on my show with with Alan Sislowski. It's that he is the Kelsey Buster. I'm a big Marvel nerd. Everybody knows this. This is not a secret. But Tony Stark invented the Hulk Buster to protect the world from the Hulk when he's on a rage. Travis Kelsey is. I'm sorry, be George Kittle is the Travis Kelsey Buster. He is your one hope that if. Travis Kelsey's on the loose in your in your fantasy playoffs, weeks 15, 16, and 17. K- Kittle could be the one guy who gets you the money. So that's why I put him in there. I know he's often injured, but if he gets Brock Purdy back, we saw the run those two went on. Those are some of my thoughts at the tight end position. Um, I kind of like Irv Smith. The more I like Irv, the, the more I look at Irv Smith, the more I like him. We saw decent use with, with Hayden Hurst last year. Uh, I think they're going to start slowly phasing out Tyler Boyd because they've got to make some cap-friendly wide receiver receiving option moves in Cincinnati as soon as next year. Irv Smith, dirt cheap. Maybe he's this year's Evan Ingram. I don't know. But those are some of the tight ends and and kind of how I'm moving them as chess pieces on the board. I love your George Kittle call, and that was a guy that I was going to say as a buy. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, J.D. JD got my back on this one, as always. But, like, I took George Kittle in uh, in a draft I drafted with Dan, our hard way draft, and – there was some pushback on where I took Kittle, and I'm like, did anybody watch the way that we ended last season? George Kittle had – J.D., correct me if I'm wrong. Did he have – there was like a four-week stretch where he was a top top five tight end every week, and I think he had a tight end one finish, a tight end two, and a tight end three finish. He had another tight end one finish. Like, you you have to kind of swallow the 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 like the ups and the downs with Kittle a little bit, but at the end of the day, you know he's going to be – a top three tight end if he's healthy. Um, and I think that the market is a little down on him. He so, had a so, th- so yeah, Theo, he, he sprinkled some week, some one and twos early, but from week 15, he gave you yeah. tight end one, tight end three, tight end 12, tight end two, tight end 11, tight end four, tight end four. Yeah. And it's, and I think that the market is just a little down on Kittle. And I think that it, there's a little bit of, of ambiguity in terms of, Kittle versus Ayuk versus Debo. People don't know which way it's going to go, plus the Christian McCaffrey factor. So I feel like it's all kind of bringing down the pass catchers in terms of how much you need to spend to get them. Like, you can go out and get Kittle for a lot less than I think he's actually worth on your dynasty roster. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll I'll piggyback on your Trey McBride call as well, Memphis, because I think it's a, he's not cheap, but he's cheaper than he was a year ago. La- a year ago, he was you know pretty expensive. He was the first tight end drafted. In, in most rookie drafts, um, and now he's you know worth less than uh, Chickaquaquo. Certainly, he's worth less than a Greg Dulcich, and I think at the end of the year he's going to regain some some value for all the reasons you brought up. Um, I think those two guys are worth kicking the tires on, and then I'll, I'll say buy high too, JD, because I think this is a transformative tight end class. Like I think buying Sam Laporta before he's played an NFL game where he's the cheapest of the big three. Like, I have a ton of Dalton Kincaid, but I also have a ton of Sam Laporta. And I think, like, Laporta could end up being a guy that's very successful in fantasy. Um, He's expensive, but he's not quite as expensive as those guys. It might be worth buying high because all it's going to take is a few games of him just running free uh, in that Detroit offense. 
having a, you know some big yak numbers and his his value is going to go up. I'll take I'll take McBride over Laporta right now, right now. And I'll take and if I can get anything on the side, cool. We are getting so lost in this rookie tight end class. You will get I, something on the side. Oh, oh you, 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 you're, the you're, you're you're damn right. I will because I'm a I'm a hell of a trader, but. It's like look at the options in in Detroit. You got Amon Ra, you know. Jam- Jamison Williams will be back if he ever stops gambling on the NFL. They brought in your boy Jameer Gibbs. It's like I know there's a pretty big pie of targets to go around in Detroit. They brought back Marvin Jones. They, they, I, I mean, I just don't see this offense. It, it didn't work for T.J. Hawkinson. Why in the hell would it work for Sam Laporta? I mean, it kind of worked for Hawkinson, but not really to our expectations. And I've seen Kyler Murray really use the tight end in Arizona, and it's literally Michael Wilson, Trey McBride, and the Smurfs. If you remember the classic Smurfs, your New York Jets back in the day, the Smurfs. Man, I'm sorry. I I will take all of the Trey McBride in his 98th percentile dominator rating over Laporta in Detroit, and he's just going to get lost in the sauce. Guys, guys, that's that's enough time on Trey McBride. I will take both for the record. And and Laporta. I'm I'm going to give you – 20 seconds right now of if you want my tight end takes, tune in tomorrow because me and Theo and Billy and Matt Schaff are going to be t- talking tight end for an hour, hour and a half, as maybe two hours. Takes, Who knows? Every, as every long single. as it takes. So if you're if you're into the tight ends, just tune in tomorrow. That's what you want to do. There you go. There you Dan, go. we got to get we got to get Dan's tight end targets though cuz t- Dan is the tight end whisperer. I I I'm going to throw you one real quick. Tyler Higby He's going to be cheap as anything. You can grab him for a song, and he's going to have a big role in that offense. Okay, guys, we've got a we got a thumbnail uh, commitment we got to make here. Let's <laughs> let's listen to this guy for a second. You guys, let me if you can hear him. Nope. Do you want me to make the? Yes, sound can you hear it? I can All hear right. it. Yeah. So basically, basically, you guys saw a clip of Debo Samuel's press conference. Uh, I think it was today, or uh, basically saying how awful his season was last year. We talk about Kittle, uh, Randy. We talk about guys who were not great last year, uh, who who disappointed. Debo Samuel is a guy it, that's given us t- uh, receiver three. We talk about you know guys who's, who have given you wide receiver one production seasons in the past. How much higher of a chance they have of repeating that? We talk about the uncertainty in this offense. You got to think that a talent, you know, we talked about Kittle, Randy. Do you agree that Debo is a nice buy right now? I don't. I, I've, I've never been a Debo guy. I think people are still chasing and smoking the hopium from that 2021 season. That that you're, you're never getting that again. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm t- especially with Brock Purdy as the QB. Um, I, I love the involvement in the running game. Um, not to say that Debo won't be useful, uh, but people still like Debo an awful lot. I would rather have Ayuk in that offense, to be, to be quite honest. I would rather buy Brandon Ayuk with with Tony Pollard, not Tony Pollard, um, Brock Purdy as, as the QB there. Uh, I think that's where it's going to be. It may take a week or two, uh, you know, with the elbow coming back from the UCL surgery, but I will gladly, I, I do think there are buys in that offense. Uh, but I do not think, sir, that Debo is one of them. I appreciate that he wants to be the man again, and I want my hair to grow back. We'll see which one of us gets lucky first. <laughs> and I'll give Randy Randy props. Randy's been running pure for years. Randy, that was your number one sell after B- Debo's big season. You were begging the Dynasty Warzone listeners to sell Debo for C.D. Lamb, even if you had to give something on top of Debo. A hundred percent. It's like it, it's like. Just ask yourself whenever you see these big outlier seasons, what is the probability of this happening again? And if it's like, like you know, like Justin Jefferson is going to have another big season, the probability is very high. It's, it's, it's the same thing with Saquon Barkley. It's the same thing with B. John Robinson. It's like all of a sudden this guy has this weird, ginormous, off-the-graph year, and we just think it's we, – we've seen it once, so we think it's going to happen forever. I, I, I've not been a Debo guy. Um, I don't think he's a Shanahan receiver guy. And if anything happens to Debo, uh, I don't want to go back and, and wax poetic too much about Kyle Shanahan. But, man, if if Brandon Ayuk ever gets that Andre Johnson, that Julio Jones volume in a Kyle Shanahan, even a, give me a Pierre Garçon year of volume in, with Brandon Ayuk, and I'll just, I'll just be tickled. 
All right, you didn't you didn't like the Debo buy. We got one more guy that's uh, hot right now, especially with you know the free agency situation and and where he's going to end up next. How are you approaching the DeAndre Hopkins situation? Where would you like him to end up? And is he someone that you're maybe buying right now, or are you trying to move him, or wait wait till he lands to move him? I have been bitten too many times by the senior, and it feels odd to call a gentleman who's 30, not even 31, yet a senior, a senior wide receiver, the aforementioned Julio Jones on the on the the Buccaneers, or there was somewhere else in between Atlanta, I can't even remember right now, or Andre Johnson on the Colts, or the the the, the Titans. This never lands. But speaking of the Titans, there's my own segue. I really hope he lands in Nashville. He's going there on Sunday, and uh, I just. Not so much that I, I'm a big D hop guy. Now, Traylon Burks is one of the guys that I actually said nice things about. I didn't want to, but I have to be honest. If D hop lands in Nashville, I'll just be giddy because all the Burks supporters will have a tear in their beer because this will be an offense that over the last three seasons has averaged about 29, 30 pass attempts a game. Tannehill completes about 65% of his passes a game. That's 21 completions a game. It's, it's like throwing a, a ham sandwich into a group of hobos. Let them fight over it. Let them fight over the 21 pass receptions that they're going to get in a given game between D-Hop and Burke and Chigs and uh, Chigaconquo and Spears. And let, let, let those guys fight for 21 catches. That's like fighting over the Baltimore wide receiving group. I, I, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm out on Hopkins. But you know what? If you're a contender and a super flex, because Mike Vrabel thinks he can win this league. They were the number one seed in the AFC as little as 2021. And if he thinks he can bring in DeAndre Hopkins, he thinks he can beat Jacksonville for that division. And and this will be an ugly team. It will not be a fantasy team. I'm sorry about your luck, but you got to hope and pray they don't come through with the money if you're a Burks backer. Alan, our our boy, Alan Soslowski, who is going to be on the GOAT district coming up uh, in the next couple weeks, uh, he, I put out a, 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 Traylon Burke's tweet about this De- DeAndre Hopkins and uh, Alan said, you know, he would like it because that's how he envisions Traylon Burks as like a Corey Davis plus. And I just like, oh, Alan, you just, you know, you made people feel even worse with that when you're trying to make them feel better. It would be terrible. It'd be just absolutely terrible for Traylon Burks. That's the guy that the argument for Traylon right now is it's a, it's a low passing volume offense, but he's going to get a huge target share. He's going to be like 20% target share. Uh, if DeAndre Hopkins goes there, Hopkins will be a target vacuum. It it would stink. It would be awful for Burks. And I was having this conversation with uh, Dallas Hyder. Dallas does the rookie rundown on the Dynasty Warzone network. Now, remember, we have two networks. We're on the player profiler, but we also have our own YouTube channel and network. To search Dynasty Warzone, you'll find the YouTube. You'll find the the podcast channel. And young Dallas and I were talking about this. I'm like, I can't see this Tennessee offense producing – two top 24 wide receivers and a top 12 tight end. And this offense is low volume as is like Dan and I joked about earlier. We had a loser leave town match. Someone between a Conquo Hopkins and Burks is going to lose a loser leaves town match. And I don't know who it is, but I don't care because I don't have much of any of them. I'll take all the Tajay Spears to be honest in Tennessee and will love us because well, will love us. (laughs) All right, boys, we are at a buck 10 and uh, I know he's kind of with us, but uh, he gave us an out at 110. So Randy's been more than generous, giving us 68 hard, hard minutes. I mean, guys, smash the like for Randy, smash the, the, the button for the man. He's and give us some comments, guys. Anything you like that he said that we've said you don't like any buys that you guys have, maybe sells that we haven't mentioned tonight. Make sure you drop those in the comment. Randy, we talked about some of the goodness that you're dropping out there on your channel, out there in Player Profiler. Remind everybody where they can get all your goodness and where they can find you. Two simple things. If you're a YouTube subscriber, then you'll find us on YouTube. Two channels, Player Profiler, Sunday nights, 9 p.m. Kiss the Ring every other Monday, 9 p.m. on Monday nights. And uh, not only the Dynasty Warzone bonus shows, but all of our buddies, like the guys at the Dynasty War Games. It's a game. It's a Dynasty Games-based podcast. Our boy Dallas doing all of his rookie content. And uh, we've got some seasonal specials coming up that will curl your hair. So make sure you're, you're tuned in. Player Profiler YouTube, Dynasty Warzone YouTube. If you're an audio consumer, same deal. Player Profiler, 
podcast feed, Dynasty Warzone YouTube feed. Everybody consumes differently, but I promise you this, 100% promise you this, it is free everywhere to subscribe on YouTube and podcast. That's what you can do. That's all I got. I'm out. And I'll say this, JD, like everybody who subscribes to Player Profiler, take the time to subscribe to the Dynasty Warzone and also take the time to subscribe to the GOAT District. Dan and JD are putting out the Owner's Lounge. With you enjoyed listening to Dan and, and JD in this sort of conversation, uh, that's a, a tremendous new show in the GOAT District that everybody's got to listen to. New episode just dropped two hours before this, so go check it out, guys. Yeah, that's that's high level dynasty talk. Every time JD and, and Dan open their mouth uh, on the owners' lounge, you're going to learn something new that's going to help you win your dynasty leagues. And during the summer, Goat District puts out a number of ballin episodes, which is our live draft show, some deep uh, best ball. Dan, JD, and I with Andrew Schellenberg, we took down the pros versus Joes FFPC, so we know what we're talking about when it comes to best ball. Dan Williamson is one of the best best ball drafters in the country. <laughs> Um, and uh, they stick with Go District all summer long and stick with Player Profiler. And I want to give a big shout out uh, to our friends at First and 15. That's our newest programming partner, uh, B Bag Batoba, Dayo, Chris. Those guys are, are tremendous podcasters. And I think that our Player Profiler uh, network is really going to get the chance to know those guys this summer. They've been on the Go District a number of times. Congratulations to those guys. Um, it's going to be an awesome summer. Stick with us all, all summer at uh, Player Profiler. And then uh, Dan is going to be joining me tomorrow. Two weeks ago, we had Josh Larkey on First Class Fantasy with Billy Muzio and I, and we hit the wide receiver position. It was a great, great episode. Uh, we covered pretty much every wide receiver going up to wide receiver four land with a couple of deep sleepers. We're going to do the same thing tomorrow with the tight end. You want to win your league. You want to hear Dan talk tight ends. You want to hear Matt Schof of Draft Sharks type, talk tight ends with Billy and I. Guys, we got some monster guests coming. Make sure you tune in every Wednesday night right here, the Player Profiler Network. We've got Nelson Sousa on top. We've got Alan Soslowski. We've got Billy Muzio. We've got the man, Matt Kelly, and a ton more of Alpha coming at you. Guys, we'll check you all later. District, you know the Pope listens. Dynasty, our religion, for the blokes missing on all of these trades, on all of these plays, on all of these grades. By the end of the day, y'all getting played. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex. Send the homie a text. That trash offers the best. You try to make it complex. Then they text you back. Now, all of a sudden, they don't make any sense. <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy. Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy. These trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T District, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do with the... And I always be traded. And I always be traded. Traded. And I always be trading. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Bait them. Bait them. Fish. Hey, you like that video? Be sure to subscribe and activate those alerts so you get notified as soon as new videos drop. And be sure to check out playerprofiler.com. We have all the tools for you to dominate every type of fantasy league. We have a draft kit, Dynasty Deluxe, Data Analysis, DFS Dominator, and don't forget the player rankings to rule them all.